Okay, hello everybody. Um, thank you for coming um, and thank you for missing the tip off of the Spartans basketball game today, um, which just started a few minutes ago. Um, for those of you not following on your phones. Um, Dean and I are here to talk to you about the Atlantic slave trade, um, one of the great crimes of humanity that took place um, in the 15th, 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries and led to the transportation of, well, the arrival of about 10 and a half million Africans in the Americas, um, about 12 million placed on ships, about one and a half million dying in the Middle Passage. Our project is about those people, um, new ways to study those people, and also ways to study their descendants um, all around the Atlantic and including in the Indian Ocean. Um, let me talk a little bit about my intellectual journey to get to this project and then hand it over to Dean, who is um, the director of Matrix, which is um, the, the the team at Matrix is putting the project together. Um, I'm a historian. I'm a historian of Africa, and my first book was about the impact of the Atlantic slave trade on small-scale decentralized societies on the Upper Guinea Coast, societies like the Bijago, Balanta, Papel, Floop, Mandinka, Fula. Um, and I wrote a book about that in the early 2000s. Um, and then later I got a Fulbright and decided I would try to see where those people ended up, which happened to be in northeastern Brazil, so my Fulbright, I went to northeastern Brazil, and there I discovered decaying documents and archives, um, plantation inventories that listed individuals by name, by ethnonym, um, had information about age, marriage, injuries, skills, these sorts of things, all laid out very neatly in charts. Um, from inventories that uh, the um, Portuguese government in Brazil had taken um, after plantation owners died. And the interesting thing for me is they named people and they, they said something in Brazil about their ethnonym, so I could actually trace those people back. Fula, Mandinka, Papel, Balanta, Floop, folks I had studied for my first book. Um, I also discovered in Brazil lots of decaying um, records in Catholic churches, baptismal records, marriage records, that also listed enslaved people by name and um, frequently had indicators of age and um, ethnic origin. Again, something that could be used to trace people back to where they had come. Um, to make a long story short, I put all of this information in a very elaborate database. I wrote a book, I wrote some articles, and then the database sat in my um, computer. Um, I'd occasionally get phone calls from people saying, hey, do you have a guy who was Balanta, approximately this age, in your database? And I would look for it. Um, and I started thinking, you know, there are a lot of historians like me um, around um, the country, around the world, who have similar projects. Um, indeed, we'd meet at conferences, present papers, um, but we weren't very good at all about sharing our data. Our data sat on our laptops and was not available to anyone else. Um, so what I did is I, I teamed up with Dean Rayberger, um, Catherine Foley, who is here in the, in the crew at Matrix, and we did a, an NEH um, grant to attempt to create a platform where scholars who have this sort of database information on their computers could make it available to the public, um, and make it available to genealogists for their own um, research, make it available to other scholars for their research, K-12 classrooms that might want to um, have a, um, um, a hold of this data. Um, we were blessed with an NEH award, and we then um, teamed up with another scholar, um, Gwendolyn Midlow Hall, who had a database of about 100,000 um, enslaved people in New Orleans, Louisiana. Again, all listed by name, had information about ethnonym, skills, um, age, marriage patterns, um, employment, all of these sorts of things. Um, and we set about a project um, really driven by Catherine Foley, who was responsible for the controlled vocabulary and did an incredibly uh, good job there, of creating a platform where we could bring people's database projects together and make them available. Um, so to make a long story short, about six, seven, eight years ago, we launched that project. It was great, and um, we began to um, interact with other scholars who had similar projects projects on their own servers that had very similar data. This is data about individuals um, throughout the Atlantic. Um, and the pro the, the, one of the immediate things we began that began to, to bother us is each one of these projects was siloed. Um, each one of these projects was about individuals, individual projects, but they weren't in conversation with um, one another. Um, the other thing that bothered us was there's still a lot of people out there with data on their individual computers that they're not sharing. 
Um, so Catherine, the rest of the crew at Matrix, Dean and I sat down um, with um, a few partners. Dean will tell you who they are at other universities. We approached the Mellon Foundation and we proposed a project. Um, and we had several objectives in mind. You can see them here. The first was we were interested in projects about enslaved individuals, people, named people. Um, well, probably a name, but not necessarily, but individuals who um, we could identify um, and we could put into databases. Um, we were also interested in ways that we can link these projects using linked open data. Um, so the projects wouldn't be siloed. We'd create a hub where we could go out and search other data. We could bring data into our own platform, make sense of it, um, but not change these other projects. Um, next, we were interested in um, best practices and workflow. That is, we wanted um, to use Catherine Foley's work as a, uh, a really a foundation. Um, the, the work we did on our original NEH project, and to instruct others about the best ways to put together these sorts of projects, projects where you're digitizing documents and then extracting data and putting it into databases. Um, third, we wanted to create and to continue to foster this publication platform, and really what we're talking about, um, the original project and our new project, is a place where scholars who have databases could publish them and get credit for it. Um, much like you're publishing a journal article, this would be an online publication and you could go to your department then and say, I have a publication. It's been vetted by peers, it's published um, digitally on this platform. Um, and finally, we were interested in preservation and sustainability. That is, there are many projects scattered around the country. How do we keep these projects going? How do we ensure that they're around for future generations? Oh, wow. And I'll hand it over to Dean to tell you what we did. You finished on time. Um, of course, Michigan doesn't play till. T oh, sorry. I didn't say, oh, wait, how do I make this go forward? You click the clicker. No. Oh, there it goes. That's why I rely on him for technical knowledge. <laughs> so, in five minutes, I'm going to explain the whole technology behind um, doing the enslaved database. Um, we did get a grant uh, for doing this um, from the Mellon Foundation. And um, you know, one of the things that they were very interested in is the idea of the importance of, of, of educating people about the, 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 the horrific uh, kind of history of slavery, um, which has never been more important than it is today. I noticed on one of our news channels um, that America should get credit for ending <coughs> slavery. Right. Um, but anyway. So anyways, um, in order to do this project, what we did is we basically said um, for the first part, what we wanted to do was a proof of concept. Um, could we take um, eight large existing projects and then bring those together so that we could go down the line and bring lots of other uh, projects together? Because one of the things that um, Walter didn't tell you about and why we're, of course, interested in best practices is for the most part, historians are, are, are lousy at collecting data, right? Now, in a good sense, they collect data for themselves. They don't always collect data thinking about how will this be preserved, how would this go on, how could this um, work with other data sets. Um, and it's really, really hard. And of course, a lot of people think that if you just have data digitized, you can just throw it all in a big pile and somehow with magic pixie dust, you can throw that on it and, and it will all work together and that doesn't really happen. So we had eight projects, um, liberated Africans from the University of Colorado, slave societies from Vanderbilt University, voyages, of course the great uh, voyages from uh, uh, slave Voyages Project from Emory University, slave biographies um, from Harvard University, biographies of the enslaved from, um, um, oh, slave biographies, of, that's actually uh, Walter's early project, biographies of the enslaved from Harvard, freedom narratives from York University in um, um, Toronto, and uh, last but not least, the Legacies Project uh, at the University College of London, which of course one of the things that we wanted to do is get an expanse of different kinds of, of data and Legacies is an interesting database. It's really about the slave owners um, and a way to keep the slave owners um, kind of uh, 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 responsible in a sense for the, all the families that made money in the UK on slavery. So our idea was could we bring those together um, and make those work? Um, what we did is See, if it was an apple, I could just press one button. See, the problem, with, the problem with Microsoft is they have lots of buttons and they make things hard for people. Um, 
So what we did is we basically took all this data and we separated it into what we call triples, um, which is simply to take all the data and separate basically out every cell of the database um, and say that this is a this is a kind of a particle of data. Um, this is a triple. It's subject predicate, predicate object. Anna born 1831 um, um, is a good example of this. Um, we're at a point in technology, which is really cool, where we can actually put everything into a big bucket, um, even billions of these bits, and then we can sort them. Um, the way that we can do that, of course, is we have to develop an ontology. Um, we spent the last year, actually Catherine spent the last year with our friends um, at Wright State, who are now at Kansas State, um, and OCLC to develop an OWL ontology as a data model so that you can have all these bits of data out there and then you have to have a model of how you could bring them together. Which brings me, oh look, I pressed the right button, um, to our diagram for how this all works together. And I'm gonna explain this diagram in approximately two minutes. And then, um, of course, I'll be happy to answer any questions. But um, the, the interesting part of the, about this project is um, it's immensely complicated in the sense that you have lots of different data sets, you're trying to bring them together. The wonderful part about this project is it's also a model for just about any other kind of data project like this. If there are other people working on things, um, we're working with uh, friends of ours on Holocaust data, um, so that you can actually bring these things together in kind of different formats. So really there's three different levels um, in terms of the project. We have the front end, um, which has basically three platforms. Um, we have the enslaved hub, which is gonna be the space for actually doing the actual searching over these um, different data sets. We have the enslaved publishing platform, um, which as Walter said, is very important. If you're in the sciences, you can publish a data set and you can actually get credit for that and you get on publications just by having a data set that's not typical in humanities. We are a weird place in humanities where we publish things on data that we never show people, right? And how we get away with that is just amazing. But we get away with it all the time. So, But we want to make a place where you can get credit for that. Um, and then finally, on the other side, we have enslaved narratives, which is kind of a special place that we're creating, actually at the beginning, where we have about 85 narratives of enslaved people as an educational space um, that will connect back into the data. So it's kind of like through um, K through um, undergraduates um, can kind of explore this data in a kind of ready-formed way. Um, the second layer is uh, my favorite layer. Um, although, as Catherine will tell you, all the layers are my favorite layer every time I talk about this. Um, so the second layer is really the data layer. And you can see over here is what we call the data, um, the data uh, uh, nodes, um, where we take in the data. And this, of course, is our eight original partners. But we can imagine, and we hope, in our next phase, add another 20 and then just keep adding from there. Um, and on this side is, so we're going to create these into linked open data. Uh, but out there are, are already linked open data resources, um, like Wikidata, via uh, GeoNames, where we can actually already pull in data um, as part of that. And then we're going to put them all into a nice data bucket. This is, see, this is my favorite part of it. Um, we can just throw everything into that big bucket because as uh, Jeff back there, who does the technology for me, says it's a real simple process with no complications. You just throw all the data in there and then you search over it. Um, actually, we have a, a quite a complex set of things going on there. We have a blaze graph um, database. Um, and as part of this, we're using a, a software called Wikibase, um, which is kind of the engine that underlies Wikidata. And we're working with Wikibase um, um, Deutschland on developing that because one of the things we want to make sure is we develop this in concert with other people doing large data projects. We're not just doing something that's homegrown and on our own. And then finally, on the bottom, what we have to do is, of course, build a whole layer of tools that will work with Wikibase that will allow us to um, bring in this data and create those triples. Um, and that's um, basically going to be based on the tool that most of you know, OpenRefine. Right? We're basically building an extension for OpenRefine. Um, in order to bring that data in. One of the important things, of course, for us is to have a disambiguation tool um, where if we have more than one person um, with the same name, is Maria in this database the same as Maria in this database? Um, and we want to be able to disambiguate that. We're never going to say it's the same person. 
because Devin always yells at me when I say this data source is exactly the same as that. We can only be sure to a 99.9%, .9%, but we might only be 60% or 50% or 40% sure that this might be the same person. You can decide, because this is the key to the whole project. You kind of think of us as kind of the Google of data. Um, we're not going to be the place where you go to, um, we're the place you search, but then we're going to actually send you back to the original data. So you can look at the original data and decide for yourself is that the same person or um, who am I looking at and the importance of that record. So in a nutshell, that's what we're doing. I'm done. Um, ready for questions. <laughs>